I don't know what I would have done if, had I been here. Uh, definitely hugged him. Uh, maybe cried a little bit. Would have been just sticky. Blah. Whew. Hi, everybody. Hi. Uh, I grew up in Southern California, and uh, I've got things. I'll, I'll intersplice my poems with the observations. I haven't been here in a long time, but I've got some great observations for you. Uh, but first, I'm going to read a poem out of this book, Crushing It. I did not bring this book. Well, I did, but they lost the bag that this book was in. Yes, yes, it was a lot of fun. Uh, this poem, I'd been dying to write a poem about Irwin Allen for years. Uh, if you don't know Irwin Allen, they call him the master of disaster. He directed The Towering Inferno, Air, Airport? Airplane. No, Airplane's the parody, Airport. Um, the Towering Inferno, did I already say that? Oh, The Poseidon Adventure, mm-hmm. And uh, I have written a couple of poems about Irwin Allen, but I wanted to find a way to connect a poem to uh, this band Killdozer wrote a song called Man vs. Nature. And in it, they mention Irwin Allen. And one day, I got it. Irwin Allen versus the lion tamer. We used to love lion tamers because people really didn't know who would win in a battle of man versus nature. Back then, all the stories ended in death, our death, by mauling or snake bite or dog bite or being struck by lightning, smothered by an avalanche, charged off a cliff, carried away in the talons of an eagle, inhaled by a whale, stung by a scorpion, swarmed by killer bees, gored by a rhino, poisoned by berries, pricked by a sticker, swallowed by quicksand, beguiled by a black cat, gobbled up by a witch. So imagine the relief with one flick of the whip and an up, the skulking lion stands on legs like a human. It's toothy protest, no big thing. After all those years of fear, I'd laugh at it too. And that's what people did until there were no more lions left to laugh at. But Irwin Allen knew death doesn't live in a thing you can kill with a gun. It's not the heat, it's the hubris. The fire that wipes the city out begins in birthday candles and the happy huff behind them. The storm that flips the cruise ship starts in the sea that rises up to fill the empty sky. The airplane crash begins not in birds, but in the feeders we've stolen the seed from. Certain nobody can see us. Thank you. And uh, I don't know if there are any uh, accordion fans out there. Uh, I saw Myron Florin perform at Polish Fest in uh, Milwaukee, where I have also lived. And let me tell you, if you have not seen Myron Florin play the accordion, <laughs> whew, uh, YouTube it, and you're welcome. When I saw him, he was, uh, I think, about 80. And uh, this is true. It's called Meeting Myron Florin. And they called him Big Red because he was like 6'2", and uh, he had red hair. Uh, still had it when I saw him. Big Red could have had any woman under the beer tent that hot Polish fest afternoon, skirts swirling atop the slamming gams of octogenarian polka groupies. <laughs> At 81, he was still all man and so cool, I'll never be that cool. His boss, Lawrence Welk, was certainly not that cool. Lawrence always looked purple to me, like he'd been screaming at the Lennon sisters during the Mutual of Omaha commercial. <laughs> I've never wanted kids, but I wanted Myron to make me pregnant. <laughs> I waited hours in the autograph line, up to my waist in blue hair. 
His fans didn't want to speed things along. When I finally made it up to the front, there he was, tan, grinning, a cold, golden beer in his hand, his wavy hair still streaked with red. I'm talking total dynamite. But what happened to your rings? I blurted, all his pimp-tastic bling flashing Morse code as his hands bounded over the accordion keys like a roided-out Russian gymnast. Myron answered to the whole crowd, an old friend got robbed leaving a gig, but the robbers couldn't get his ring off, so they took his finger. <gasps> the fans gasped. Myron grinned and winked at me, which flushed a bursting sweat bead down my ass crack. And that's why I don't wear them anymore. Hooray, the crowd cheered. Good call, someone shouted. And everyone laughed except me, the goon who couldn't tell a body or its wake from the glitz it's shed. Thank you. I recommend um, Tiger Rag. He's very young when he does that one. Uh, and this is called Old Women Talking About Death. It's about uh, my mother's people. And they have, they're from Southern Illinois where um, daddy has three syllables, daddy. And, uh, oh, all the people named in this uh, are, I use initials. My brain told me to do that and I said, okay. Old women talking about death. When did I become one of them? I used to roll my eyes at their gory stories. EMTs found a neighbor at the bottom of her basement steps, a head-to-toe hematoma. Use a cane, I told her, shrugs. Grandma and the great aunts itemized her injuries. Poor dear, how long till she was found? They told their stories picnicking atop our people in the cemetery, atop all the men in our family who died young. The rest disappeared, shrugs. So no stories for them. These days when I call Kay, she tells me about her friends who are dying or have died since we last spoke. And I feel closer to her, an adult. Yesterday, Jay filled me in on M's cancer. It's bad, she whispered. I leaned forward. M's doctors removed her necrotic uterus through her abdomen in two jammy black hunks because her insides had decayed into a sarcomatous tar pit. Then her incision dehissed. I cocked my head. She made a starburst motion over her belly button. Ah, I've heard that happens with cancer, I said. Grateful Z described the process to me after her stepmother died. Now I even have a word for that indignity. Thank God. I hate surprises. Thank you. Yeah, they did all that. I thought everyone's people did that. I didn't know that um, they didn't. Let's see. This is called um, Wolverine Season. Oh, honey, are you okay? I asked the woman in the bathroom, soaking wet as if she'd just emerged from the shower. Yeah, maybe too much rum on an empty stomach. She wiped her mouth with her hand and left. In the sink, waxy red flecks of lipstick. That woman just puked up lipstick in the bathroom, I yelled in my friend's ear over the Black Sabbath tribute band. Write a poem about that, she winked. <laughs> we were up late for a school night. It was all part of the new regimen. The documentary I'd just seen about death said rocking out is actually good for you. And rocking out to Sabbath. <laughs> Dude, we were going to live like forever on the bones other animals passed up. <laughs> Thank you. Yay. Mm. Mm. 
this is uh, my, my friend uh, Ada Lamone, who was coincidentally the poet laureate of the United States of America. Yes. Um, when, once she became the poet laureate of the United States of America, we've known each other for a long time. And I'd say, I love it when you get angry and gross in poems. And she'd say, I love it when you talk about your family, at very different wants for each other, very different wish lists. And, uh, but once she became the poet laureate, I said, okay, now I got to do whatever you say. So she told me to write this. <laughs> it's called The Gift. You can tell whether a bird has a mate if there are pin feathers on its head new feathers that start out as stubs full of blood, then enshroud themselves in a white scaly coat as they grow. Preening releases the feather, but a bird can't reach the top of its own head. A mate preens that spot, unless the bird is alone in a cage. Pin feathers itch, so I preen my unpaired birds, wrap them in a towel, scritch their heads, and blow till dandruffy stuff flutters out. They looked pretty mangy this morning, I recall, as I stare at the side of my mother's face from the back seat. How long has it been since I took her in for a haircut? And her whiskers, she can't see to shave. We're driving back roads, pointing out deers and hawks as she ahs before taking her back to her apartment. My husband calls it traveling gravel. She loves it when he drives and I sit in the back so she could talk as much as she wants. He always answers her questions. Sometimes I'll go hours without saying a word while she talks and talks. When I was little, she'd bring a book to restaurants and read while I, no doubt, talked and talked. Things children said weren't interesting to her, she told me. And family never had to say, I'm sorry. Yes, we've hurt each other, but only I've done it on purpose. Did I tell you? She bought me this car. It's the most generous gift I've ever received. I said, Did you, do you like that poem? And she said, yeah, yeah, don't do it again, though. <laughs> and uh, this one is about my Aunt Marilyn, who, uh, if, we, if we were... If she was here, we would all be having a much better time. Uh, probably there would be tequila shots lined up for later. And uh, so uh, I always, I'm always grateful to have known such an incredible person. And this is called Marilyn, Every Day We Wonder. Marilyn, every day we wonder what you'd think about all this. I imagine you crashing through the inaugural barricades or flying a stolen helicopter into a wildfire with a margarita gripped between your knees. Remember, gridlocked on the five, you winked at a bearded dude leaning on an asphalt roller? I'd only seen women wink at men in movies. He leered, I might get laid. And you drawled, why don't you get that piece of shit out of the road? Shock splashed across his face. Lock the doors, crazy bitch, he roared and punched our hood clueless how close he was to getting his ass shot. We found the loaded gun under your mattress, Smith & Wesson, cowgirl style, swirly pearl handle, and the serial number filed off. We like to take it out at parties. What a cute gun. We also found several transistor radios and a box of old weed. Cheers, Auntie. With one phone call, you scared my scary Brooklyn landlord into fixing my deadbolt. You were six states away and a 72-year-old woman. There's a pack of kids down the street in a house that's falling apart. We never see an adult. No matter how cold or dark it is, they're always playing outside with a new puppy. We have no idea where the old puppies have gone. But if you were here, we know there'd be no more of this new puppy bullshit. Thank you. Uh, and now 
I want to um, read from this book that is also in the suitcase that's floating around. It is an anthology of uh, nature poetry that Ada edited, and it's called Poetry in the Natural World, and I thought I would read my poem from it. They're all uh, just amazing. Uh, I never, it, it's just full of surprises, poem after poem. Five stars, highly recommend. So this is called Central Iowa Scenic Overlook. At eight inches tall, 18 inches wide, and six and a half feet off the floor, the awning window in the showers, not for light or looking. It's a utilitarian slit that lets out steam and stops the walls from swelling their cellularities. September through June, you have to look up to look out at a sliver of orange garage roof pinned by a late day hard water haze that makes it tough to towel off between the toes somehow, to skirt the third rate, third degree. Have I ever been happy? How long has the AC been on high, feeding us our own sour breath and dead skin flakes? But by July, garden feelers creeping up the shower's outside wall get tall enough to crest the sill, breach the pane, and flood the pale tiles in submarine greens and squishy pinks from dawn and on and on. First come sage, sunflowers, and bumblebees, so pollen-socked they can't lift off. Thus they lumber over earth star perforated patchy grass like unshaved sheep, dodging the dog, who will eat them. Sharp shreds of sunflower seeds raining down from sparrows overstuffed beaks and swashbuckling chipmunks catching shards mid backflip and cashing them in flower pots. This system, insatiable. Seriously, something, a possum, dragged a skull, a possum's, in through the doggy door and set it in a spot of empty floor where we'd be sure to see it. Scoured and tan as smoker's teeth, it hissed, insatiable. Come August, such effulgence, it's like showering in a 3D movie. Goldfinch squads and speedos yo-yo through the stems, turn hard and vanish peripherally. One cad outside the glass flashed me the shadow running down his ripped finch abs. I was naked and coughed up a bona fide gasp. <laughs> Thank you. Emperor.